Hello and good afternoon. Happy Saturday. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Wherever you are. Welcome to the Saturday stream. Can we have an AV check? Happy anniversary. Nata. And to answer the question, are these clips uploaded on YouTube? Uh, they will be uploaded onto my main YouTube channel as a, um, a monthly highlight. Hopefully soon. They need compiling. We've got a few months worth now, so it's worth doing it. Uh, yes, Giddy. We are at, at my local airfield. Well, not my local one, but at my airfield that I fly out of. The thing missing about the last clip is the explanation. It was on the flights and best with the tree. Lol. Um, I actually, I need to apologize. I actually have a new highlight video and in the rush to get ready today, because like so many things needed updating, um, I, can, I forgot to swap it in. <laughs> I forgot to swap in the new highlight video, so you've got that to look forward to tomorrow. <laughs> ah, the infamous soon. I don't, I don't want to play it for you now. It'll kind of spoil it, Error Spike. You can watch it tomorrow at one. Premiere it today. Oh my god. Are you actually serious? You actually want me to show you the highlight video now? It's like probably 60% the same as the last one. Just some new bits. You're so impatient. First time in the stream in two years, Ben GTF Chell. I don't recognize the name, but welcome back. Fly a proper plane, not some child toy. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Crawly Snipe, 31 months. Nice flying for the anniversary. Thanks for the fun and entertainment. Thank you very much, Crawly. Seriously, no, we'll wait, Captain Flint. All right, we'll wait till tomorrow at one o'clock then. <clears throat> Happy anniversary, Nutter. Where do you know the snowfield from? Um, you've probably seen it in one of my videos. Sales count. Good shares at reasonable prices. No idea, trucker tails. I use a GT Omega. 5% off with my code. <clears throat> Are you going to go back to Mysa Makara at all the next couple of months? Wasn't I playing Mysa Makara two weeks ago? <laughs> Pretty sure I was. Right. Today. 5% off, wink, wink. Um... Today, well, the 5% off will pretty much save you on your delivery costs. Put it that way. It's in the title. Explain to them. VFR, you expect to see your house in law. <laughs> yes, I'll just fly over my house and point it out for everybody on the internet. That sounds like a good idea. Yen Freak, thank you for 42 months. Smithy, thank you for 21. Let's see what the licensed pilot can do today, Kappa. Also, didn't you know that you can share anniversaries in the iOS app now? Uh, I think they added that a couple of months ago, maybe. T-Rex, thank you for half a year. Matryoshka, 26 months. Two questions. One, will you try out the VDL Coach DLC for Fernbus Tourist Bus Simulator at some point? Maybe. Two, will you try out the new DLC that was released a few days ago on Bus Sim 18? You mean the one that I previewed last Saturday and crashed every five minutes? The one that I sent the save game to the developer and they didn't get back to me? That one. I don't even know if it works, Matryoshka. Crawley, 31 months. Nice flying for the anniversary. Thanks for all the fun. You're welcome, Crawley. Thank you. DJ Kenty, 22. Welcome back. Namari with 15. Uh, Jamie Bell with 29 this morning. Um, I don't know if I carry on. I don't know. Happy anniversary. <laughs> I'm not going to say yes in case I don't. I'm not going to say no because I probably maybe will. So if I just say I don't know, that's probably covers all the bases. I've got a get out clause to never do it. And equally, I can do it if I feel like it. <laughs> it's like a political answer <laughs> I'm fine, thank you Presley Oh 
old. Try not to hit a tree today. That joke's never going to get old. <laughs> ben, thank you for 40 months. Where's the time gone? Just wish I could uh, tune in more often, Ben. Well, thank you for staying subbed. And thanks for double top months. Trusting Sky, 11 months. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay Smith, thank you very much for subbing, Lindsay. Welcome to the Nerd House. Thanks for your support. Yen Free, thanks for 42. Right, so today we're going to start off um, by taking a flight from Earl's Cone. We're going to head down to Lid. Does anybody know where Lid uh, Field is? Holy sub bomb, PC Tech. Five subs gifted from PC Tech. Thank you very, very much. If you just got gifted a sub, please remember to thank PC Tech for his awesomeness. Thank you. Lid, L-Y-D-D. -L -D. I've got a new toy. I'm going to show you it now. Okay, here's my new toy. Thunk. This is my new toy. It's my iPad. This is my Sky Demon app. Therefore, I can show you where Lid is. I can, I can do back. stuff. I can show you airspaces and airways and stuff. <clears throat> Hopefully, you can read that. Um, yeah, so what I thought we'd do is we'd fly down to Lid, um, except I shall I shall fly the route as if I was flying it in real life. In other words, pay attention to airspaces and stuff. I mean, obviously, I can't talk to ATC, but I can kind of show you the thought process that you go through. <clears throat> Why don't you select to uh, have a, an alert for people Welcome who's gifting? Back. I haven't got round to it yet, Furrybird, but it is on my list. <clears throat> uh, I'm not using FS Economy, Matroshka. Chat can be ATC. Lol. As if. <laughs> Welcome to the Nut House. Well, I can tell you what I would say to ATC. Even though we don't actually have somebody to talk to. Uh, so, Ropey, thank you for half a year. Sim for fun, thank you as well welcome for half a year. L. Phillips, Bing Bong, welcome to Squirrel Airlines. We'll try to avoid trees, but we can't promise. Please buckle your seatbelts, prepare for the ride. Food will be provided. No, they won't. Where do you get that idea from? Thank you for the amazing work, and here's some more in the future. Thanks, L. Phillips. Right, so this is what we do. And my monitors just clip out the top of my iPad so I can't actually see. Create routes, right? This is what you do. Create routes. And you say, where am I flying from? I'm going to fly from Earl's Cone. Where are you flying to? I'm going to go to Lid. There's Lid Airfield. And create route. That. Boom. Aye, aye, aye. That's your route. Yeah, chat, chat air traffic control. I can't think of anything that can go wrong. Uh, Cranius, thank you for 200 bits, Cranius. Uh, now that you have your PPL, is flying the same plane and sim different now? Um, I'd say when you do it for real, everything kind of makes a lot more sense. Because, you, like... I don't know, like... All the theories there are in a sim, but when you do it for real, it's actually real, you know what I mean? So you can't just mess it up. You can't just skip checklists. You can't just faff around like, ah, we'll be fine. We'll just turn in here and make it land. Like, you can't do any of that. You, you like, have to do. <laughs> there's a reason why things are the way they are, put it that way. And there's a reason for checklists and all the rest of it, and it kind of brings it all together when you do for real. Anyway, lid is down here. Right. On the south coast, though, in Kent, you see. Now, the interesting thing about Lid is... You see that? The interesting thing about Lid is it's actually got danger areas nearby. Can you see those red things? <coughs> They're actually danger areas. This one here, the circle, is Dungaree's Lighthouse. And if you, if you look at it, though, it says surface to 2,000 feet. If you click on it, it tells you it's a restricted area, surface to 2,000 feet. So, so that lighthouse, you can kind of just about go into that. You're allowed to, to just nip into it slightly. Because if, um, if you look at the pattern, the landing pattern at Lid is a little bit interesting. 
in that they don't actually have they don't actually have a dead side and you're not allowed to descend on that side either we'll talk about that in a second but you can kind of see the shape of the the shape of the pattern is not actually like a rectangle like that one of the sides is kind of cut off a little bit so if you're landing on zero three you kind of come in on that top side there where the pink arrow is coming in. You kind of come in there and you turn right and then you make a very sort of cut off base leg to make a landing. That's the one I did last week, I think. I think it was last week in real life. That was, that's quite interesting, that one, because you you pretty much cut the throttle and glide it in. That's that's how short that is. Um. PJTR, thank you for 17 months. Flying squirrels. Ken Barlow with 27, preparing for takeoff. World of Mandus, thanks for 54. Dead Mouse also with 54. Great to see flights and begin. All the best as always. Thank you, dude. Uh, IT31, thanks for four months. However, I think we'll probably take the other approach this time. We'll take out 2 1. So we'll come in on the south side and then make a left turn. So the other danger area is this one here. This is surface to 4,000. I think this is a military one i think lid ranges so this is a firing range <laughs> so you you definitely don't want to fly over this one Welcome back. active every day so they have a mil like some kind of military shooting range down here that you don't want to go anywhere near um so generally speaking we'll talk about the approach in a second but if you actually look at lids plate it tells you how to approach and when to talk to them and that kind of thing uh, there is a danger area over here, but generally you don't need to bother too much about that one. Unless you're coming in from the northeast, which is it's fairly unusual. But that's more like the area Summer uses to play at. Probably. Now, um, scroll back up here a second. And you'll see the big problem here is that we fly right smack bang across South End's airspace. Right? So you kind of have two choices, really, when you when you make this route. You either go around South End, yeah, which is doable, or you get permission to fly through their airspace. That's, and that's the preferred option, really. Uh, and the reason it's a preferred option, because it might sound harder, but it's actually not. You have no clue what all this means, Lindsay. <laughs> I can explain things if you want. Um, you, see the, you see the kind of blue sector... Yeah, the big blue odd shaped thing. That's south. That's the start of South End's airspace. And if you click on it, it says South End CTA. Uh, three and a half thousand to five and a half thousand. So you can kind of, you can be in that bit if you're below three and a half. You was watching at three this morning. They were in a simulator, Dead Mouse. Um, who are you talking about? Uh, I'm not that familiar with the rules of flying. Just like to relax and watch. That's fine, Audi. That's fine. But I can, you know, I can answer things. It's cool. So anyway, you can either go round it. So we could take a route this way, for example. There's Chelmsford. We could go down to Brentwood like that, uh, and effectively just do something like this, where we just go all the way around the blue bit. That is where some member of your family fly from. Nice. Well, if the weather holds, I'm going to be flying to Lid again next week. But hopefully this time and taking the cameras. Good afternoon, Kelly. Now, the advantage of going this way is... There's the Thames there. You would kind of fly over this interesting bit here, which is Lakeside and Blue Water and the Dartford Crossing. So it's kind of scenic in a way. Uh, Ferro Bird, it's Citation Max now. Citation Max. He was Cirrus Max, but it's now Citation Max. Yeah, I know they were in Nico Sim. Uh, Sky Demon, Mad Mick. Why can't you just fly through and adjust your altitude as you go? Um, so, imagine, the reason South End has this kind of blue area, and if you look, they all do, like there's Gatwick down there. Gatwick's a bit simpler if you just look at it. You can see what it is, it's effectively a series of concentric areas yeah and imagine imagine they are actually in the sky 
right? So the outer one is like high up. And then as they get nearer the airfield, they come down like that. And the reason is to allow the planes to approach, yeah? So you've got all these jets coming in to Gatwick from all across Europe. And they need to be able to safely be vectored in. So you're not allowed in there unless you're talking to them, basically. Yeah, it's exactly right. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see that shelf in action. Do you see the, see the blue bit doing this? So the bottom section of the screen is actually a vertical profile. And as, as it gets to the airfield, it hits the, it hits the ground like that. So it's a series of shelves going up. Um, whereas, you know, S South End's airspace is a bit messy. <laughs> it's a little bit messy. It's got this like big red area here. And uh, it's a very, very strange shape. But the problem, anyway, the problem with going down this gap, um, and the reason there's a gap here is because this one is covering London. There's Heathrow on the left, though. <clears throat> Basically, you can fly between this gap, but it's uncontrolled airspace, yeah? So you're flying through a narrow corridor in uncontrolled airspace with planes going north and south. It kind of increases the risk of flying pretty close to somebody else. So you can go that way if you want to, but it's not really advised. What, what's actually better is to go, plan to go directly over South End, because normally when you talk to them, normally when you talk to them, um, they, may make, they may ask you to wait outside for a bit, but they'll generally vector you straight over the top of the airfield. And the reason they go over the top is because, if you imagine on the runway, all the planes are, like, doing this. If you fly right over the top, you, you're not going to be anywhere near them. So they can see where you are, they're talking to you, and they're just like, right, straight over the top. And also, you're then in, you're then in control airspace, so you're safe, because they are going to keep you separated from everybody else. So if they've got somebody else coming the other way, they'll just put you at different heights or vector you around. So it's actually safer. <laughs> Being in control airspace is safer. Yeah. But you don't have the freedom to do what you want. You're told what to do. You're told which way to fly. Like last time I entered it, they asked me to fly here to Southwood and Ferrers. You see how there's a V there? That bit there. I'm going. That V that you see is a visual reporting point, and there are a number of them that are scattered around these airfields. You see there's one down here on the, on the bottom. There's one there, just south of South End. They are, they are used as, like, key points for ATC to tell you. They'll say to you, um, fly directly to South and Ferrers VRP. That means go there which is what happened last time. They told me to go there first. They were trying to sort of slow me down, I think, while somebody else came through. It's, it's kind of like a checkpoint, Lindsay, but what it really is is there is something very, very obvious that a pilot can use to see, yeah? Like South Wadham Ferrers itself is very easy to distinguish because it's right on that estuary there. You can't miss it. It's this, it's this built-up area right next to the estuary. So it's a very good place to say to a pilot, go there, because you can see it really easily. And the same with the other VRPs, Gateway Port. I've not been to that VRP, but that will be pretty obvious. It'll have those, those masts there, and there'll be a port there. So you've got to know the VRPs in case they tell you to go to them. Yeah? You sort of get it. <laughs> uh, let me just undo that. So anyway, what we'll do is we'll take off out of Earl's Cone. We'll come out of 2-4, and we should be able to pick up Whittam fairly easily, which is there. Whittam is, like, quite easy to spot as a town. And we're using all back scenery, so we should see it pretty well. Uh, then, you know, normally at Whittam, before we get to Whittam, I would normally talk to South End and tell them what I'm doing and ask them for permission to overfly. Uh, but we'll cover that when we get up there. In terms of altitude, I'll probably fly 2,000 feet. Oh, it's what we plan to fly at. So we'll put that on 2,000 there. So that's what we'll plan to do. 
So at the bottom, it's showing as the vertical space, yeah? So if you imagine, imagine you're looking, looking top down on a cake, well, the bottom of the screen is like a cross section of the cake. That's what you're seeing. <clears throat> you should go through your tongue. What do you mean, Presley? Sky Demon, Heli Pilot, Sky Demon. It's kind of like, um, what's it called? What's the American one? Um, not Navigraph. Can't think of the name. Four Flight. It's like Four Flight, except Sky Demon's useful, very useful for the uh, VFR stuff in the UK. It's really good for it. <laughs> what sort of cake? Chocolate cake. <laughs> Can hear the passion in your voice once you explain. Really nice to listen to, Aldi. Thank you. Not all viewers understand what Captain Flint. Yeah, I'm trying to explain what I can, but obviously some of it, some of it is going to be known to you guys. Some of it will just go over your head. But hopefully you'll learn something. Like basically when you plan a flight, it's not like planning a, a journey in a car where you just say, eh, sat nav, I want to go here and it'll just take you down the motorways. Like it's nothing like that. You've got to plan it out. You've got to look at where you're flying. You've got to look at the airspace you're going through. And then it's not, it doesn't stop there because once you get south of South End, yeah, like they will tell you that you're, they will tell you to fly, you know, over the ATZ, over the runway, basically. But unless they're, unless they're giving you specific vectors, they may not tell you exactly which direction to go in. So if you was to directly head south, if you came out of South End and went straight south, you would smash straight through these here. Two more danger areas. Yeah. Which is ironic because there's no physical limitations of roads in the air. Uh, yes, Fon, but there's, all, there's many other planes flying around. Seems very stressful. It's only the pilot has to worry about it. <laughs> so you've got gas venting here. Surface to three and a half thousand. You don't want to be anywhere near that. Right? So... When you when we when we get over South End and we start heading across uh, the Thames Estuary here, you'll be able to see we should be able to see those gas sites, and you should be able to see sheer, see how Sheerness is a VRP V on it. We should be able to see that as long as we as long as we go through that that town bit there, we're fine. We'll be clear of this. So much stuff for your little head, <laughs> and then after that. You know, at this point here, when you get out of the blue bit, that's where you leave um, South End's airspace. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. They'll basically, they'll put you on what's called a basic service. But they're no, you're no longer under radar control at that point. In other words, in other words, they're talking to you. You're talking to them, but they're not controlling you anymore. They're not telling you where to fly anymore. <clears throat> so anyway, you keep going south. Um, now Ashford here, we'll come to Ashford in a second, but it's, it's, it's quite a good place to vector to because you can see Ashford fairly clearly. It has a river running right through it. So when you're doing like visual flying, VFR flying, there are things that are really, really good, right? Stuff like, you know, a town with a river going through it. Two nice bits of information, two things that you can see fairly in, fairly easily. You tend not to use roads because roads can vary in size. Motorways are fine, but like smaller roads can be very hard to spot. But railway lines are good. Rivers are good. Um, obviously, mountains, if you had them, or even at masts, if there's like a high mast or something, great. You can actually see a train line down here, though. Yeah, but Ashford's got this river running through it. It should, it should be fairly easy to spot. Uh, so what else have we got on route? So nothing else on route. Once we get to Ashford, uh, we should be fairly clear. We're not flying over anybody. There is a parachuting site over here, you see it? You see the parachute symbol? But we're not flying anywhere near that, so we're okay. Uh, was that video your daughter recorded we saw on stream yesterday? Yeah, she got a phone out and just basically panned over. I won't be flying online, no. Uh, so, right, one last thing to look at before we get to lid. If we actually click on lid, and 
and then A T Z. Actually let's do it this way. Let's click on our fields. And we'll go to go to lid and we have a look at uh, let's see. Not that one. Coolies plate that one, I think it is. So that's lid itself, that gives you the plate. Um, and if you scroll down here, it gives you joining instructions in the bottom section. Yeah? So it says, inbound VFR aircraft should make your initial call for joining instructions before reaching ba -ba 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 -bum, Ashford at 12 nautical miles. So that's one of the reasons why you route to Ashford, because when you get to Ashford, you want to basically say to Southend, right, I'm going talking to Lid now. Yeah? So when you get to Ashford, you drop south end, you go and talk to Lid. At which point it says Lid is not equipped with radar. Um, so what you need to do is speak to them and put their VFR transponder code in. So they've got you on a transponder. And then it says, uh, boom. right, circuits. You see the circuits at the bottom? Circuit height is 1,000 feet Q and H. There is a bit on here. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Matter. Oh, there it is. There it is. So just above circuits where it says, do not descend dead side in capitals at the bottom. You see it? It says, unless otherwise instructed, join overhead at 1500 feet, descend crosswind and turn downwind at 1000 feet Q and H. Do not descend dead side. Does anybody understand that? <laughs> Some of you might understand that. Cross over at 1500, descend on the crossed wind, and then 1000 feet on the downwind leg. Does that make any sense to anybody? <laughs> Mods, could you ask Paul that question, please, on whether he would do an IRL stream when actually flying? Duke to Duke, there are technical issues with that. There are technical issues with holding a stream while flying. You don't understand. All right, so let me explain. Uh, let's go quickly back to this bit here. Actually, I think if you look at an aerial photograph, it might make a bit more sense. Okay. Can you actually fly a plane? Yes. So there's the lid. You can see lid there. And there are two pink arrows coming in. So basically, depending on what runway you're landing on, you come in on one of those pink arrows, right? We're going to come in on 2-1. We're going to land on 2-1. So we're going to come in on that southern pink line. You see it? So we're going to overfly the bottom part of the runway at 1500 feet okay we're going to be there at 50 we're going to make sure we're at 1500 when we overfly that part of the runway then between the runway and what's called the downwind leg the downwind leg is the is the i wish i could draw on this guys i need to be able to draw on this somehow for you <laughs> i don't know how to do that Basically, when we when we get over the runway, yeah, immediately we start descending down to a thousand feet. Immediately. So that by the time we get to the white line and turn, we're at a thousand feet. That's what we need to do. So we need to lose five hundred feet overhead the runway and down to the white line. Then turn at a thousand feet. Then we're at the pattern altitude. So when we're on that white line, go in the opposite direction to the runway, that's the downward leg. We're at a thousand feet doing that. Snip tool and then paint. The trouble is it's on my it's on my tablet. It's on my tablet, isn't it? How can I use paint when it's on my tablet? <laughs> Hopefully it'll make sense. It'll make sense when we do it. So apart from that, that's the main thing about this this airfield is is you come over at fifteen hundred, you lose five hundred feet, and then make your turn. The scenario you're crossing near Ashford as a glider site, it's shown on both the map and the vertical profile. One sec. 
Right, so here's the other thing. If you click on the warnings tab, it will tell you if there's any problems with your journey. Yeah. So it says you're passing through South End controlled airspace. Uh, and at the top there, I wish my tablet wasn't so high. At the top there, it says your journey passes very close to Chalik gliding site. Yeah. And this is one of the cool things about Sky Demon. When you've punched your route in, you can click on the warnings tab. And if you've missed anything, yeah, if you've missed anything, Captain Flint, it will tell you. Because when you click on the top there, your journey passes through Chalik gliding site. We click on the little symbol and it highlights us for us. Yeah. So you're quite right, Captain Flint, but I was saving that bit for the end. <laughs> yeah. It is easy to miss that. That is a gliding site. And when I flew down there, it was active. So as we're flying along, there was a glider like a thousand feet above us and there was another one below us buzzing around and they have right of way. South End? No, South End is a Class D airspace, <laughs> bizarrely enough. Generally speaking, we have Class A and, and Class D mostly in this country. We don't have any Class B airspace. I don't know if we have any C. So anyway, what we need to do is when we get near Chalik, which is there, we just need to skirt around it. What are the classes for? Uh, classification is... It goes all the way down to G. So classifications is actually... Let me see if I can find it for you. There are rules about... Um, <coughs> there are rules about whether you need... Whether you need um, certain equipment that kind of thing. Okay, if I put that onto there. And then we do that for a second. There we go. Airspace classifications. So control airspace, outside control airspace. There are rules about it. So for example, <clears throat> class A, I'm gone. Class A airspace, right, which is those like, you know when you're flying jets and you basically go through the airways, they're all Class A, right? So straight away, no VFR traffic, absolutely no VFR traffic in Class A. So you have to be talking to radio, you have to be getting ATC clearance, you have to fly IFR, you cannot fly VFR, that's Class A. So, uh, you know, I am not allowed to fly in Class A airspace because <clears throat> I don't have an instrument rating. So that's the, that's the big boys. That's all the jet jetways above, generally. Then you get down to, you notice how we don't have a B. They have a B in America, but in the UK we don't use B. So then you get down to things like C, D, and E. Now, South End is a D. There are certain weather minimums that you can pay attention to down here. There's speed limitations that apply. Whether you need to be talking to radio or not. So C and D, you have to be talking to radio. You have to get... ATC clearance, but you can equally, if you look at this, there's like VFR, special VFR, you know, class C, you can actually get a VFR transit, what's known as a special VFR, um, straight through it. This one, traffic information provided, it that concerns whether they give you, whether you can request from them a traffic service or not. Yeah. Yes, I've got my night rating. Um, that this is how the airspace is cut up now g which is everything else so when i fly over like norfolk and suffolk i'll be in g this is like the wild west <laughs> and the main reason it's like the wild west if you look at it you don't even need a radio <laughs> like you don't have to be talking to anybody you can be just pottering around and that's why it's not great that's why i'd rather be in controlled airspace if i can just because it's a lot safer because <laughs> you just do anything you want here it is literally just the open seas, you know. No man's land, exactly. I mean, the rules of the air still apply. Like, you know, a glider has to give way to a balloon. A plane has to give way to a glider. Like, all those rules still apply. 
but you can't see each other, you can't talk to each other, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. Bush pilot flying, yeah. Except the UK is quite, a, you know, in terms of how many people live here and our landmass, we're not small. Like, if you went to Australia and bush pilot flew, you might not see another plane for a week. But over here, it's not like that. Uh, VFR, visual flight rules and IFRs, instrument flight rules. Correct. Yeah. So they're basically concerned with, like, with instrument flying, you have to fly specific, specific vectors and routes, and you have to plan it beforehand, and you'll be told your departure procedures and things like that. With VFR, uh, it's completely different. When you take off, say, out of South End, they'll say to you, um, you know, say to make left turn, left turn out. That's all they'll say, or, you know, go south. Like, they'll kind of give you that kind of routing. Happy How do you avoid other planes in G? Matter. With these. Giddy. And I, I'm literally not joking with these. However, it's not quite... It's not quite all that bad. For example, quite often people will get a basic service. So if I fly out to Norfolk and Suffolk, I'll speak to Wattisham and I'll ask them for a basic service. And what that basically means is it's somebody to talk to. They are not obliged to give you anything. They're not obliged to give you any traffic information. They're not obliged to tell you if you're about to fly to another plane. But generally speaking, they will. Yeah. They'll, they'll report traffic for you. If they're not too busy, they'll say to you, you know, there's a PA-28, 10 miles to the north, same altitude. Like, they'll give you information from what they can see on their radar. It's not a flight following, uh, Tony B. Flight following, flight following is like the UK's traffic service, yeah? So if I was to call Southend and ask for a traffic service, if they give it to me, that will be the same thing. They'll tell me about other traffic. They're obliged to do that. They have to tell me about other traffic. If I ask for a basic service, they're not. They don't have to, but they usually will. But if the controller's got a high workload, I will be dropped off that workload. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's that's how you, you can read this if you want to. Um, it's all on the Nats website if you want to sort of memorize that. You are t if when you do your PPL, you are tested on this stuff. You have to memorize this on your PPL because you have to know about the different classifications. Let me just flick that off, put that back on. Um, but that is on, I'll link it for you. So you've got it there. On the web, on the Nats website there, if you scroll down, you should find that diagram. There we go, let's put that back, put that back. And we'll drop that back for now. There we go. It's quite a lecture for you. Yeah, sorry. Let, let's just go. Let's just do some fun. <laughs> it's for all the people that want to know, right? So we've got our routing. Um, now, having got our warnings checked and we're fine, we're fine with this stuff because we know about all of these and we're going to go around the gliding site. So we know about all that. We've dealt with it. Um... We then check the NOTAMs. Now, the NOTAMs are important because Welcome they... Back. NOTAMs are a notice to Ehrman, in case you don't know what that stands for. Notice to Ehrman is what NOTAM stands for. And, and if there's anything like, you know, active sites, restricted areas, anything and everything will be here. You basically go for like an obstacle light. You know, if you've got like a tower and the light's not working, it'll be a NOTAM uh, so that you're aware of it. And you have to read through that. <coughs> Sky Demon without an A. Matter, yeah. You don't stand half of it. <laughs> Finally, you'll check the weather. The weather is super important. Like the weather is, is quite literally one of those go no go scenarios. Yeah. If you look through the weather and what you'll see, this this basically decodes the weather for you. But for example, for where we're flying today, uh, South End is obviously very important to us. So South End, it says twenty five minutes ago, wind was two nine zero, at nine knots. That's how we know which runway we're going to be taking off out of. Um, pressure, 1018. Visibility is 10K. Few clouds at 3,000 feet. Perfectly flyable weather. Yeah. Whereas the TAF, which is a terminal area forecast, which is just below it, uh, the TAF is rated from 12 Zulu time to 2100 Zulu time. So that's basically all afternoon and early evening. It's saying the forecast is 
scattered at two and a half thousand, but otherwise pretty good weather. Yeah. So you look through that and make a decision about whether you're going to fly or not. That's that. That's that done. Difference between Sky Demon and Four Flight, uh, Matty. Sky Demon focuses on the UK and Europe. Uh, primarily, it's about VFR. Four Flight um, has a big thing in America. Uh, they have a lot of European stuff now that they're building up rapidly. Is way better if you're doing inst instrument flying. Um, it's a very, very good tool. And uh, Four Flight's got more features than Sky Demon. Sky Demon's a lot cheaper. But if you're VFR in the UK and Europe, Sky Demon's really good. Uh, Baz, I'm definitely not doing that, bro. <laughs> definitely not doing that. <laughs> right, so um, what you then do is you click on the pilot log at the top and you print this out. This, this is quite literary, and this is the beautiful thing about Sky Demon. Because when you learn to fly for real, right, you have to, everything that you see here, you would have to look up and write on your knee pad manually. And you have to calculate it all manually. And that's what you have to do to get your PPL. So you list out your waypoints. You, you list out the altitude that you're going to fly at. You calculate your MSA. Anybody know what MSA is? The level, the true airspeed. We're not going to get into a discussion about airspeed. <laughs> the true airspeed, which is, comes from your plane. Uh, the track that you're going to take, you draw it out on a map. You calculate the track. You put your winds down that you've looked up from your forecast and you calculate your magnetic heading. That takes into account the wind and the compass deviation to give you a true magnetic heading. <laughs> Trust me, that is the biggest pain about doing your PPL. Having to do all this stuff manually and you do have to know how to do it. Like nowadays, we can just bring up Sky Demon and it just calculates it all for us. And it, it literally saves you quite a lot of time. Um, but when you learn, you have to do all this manually. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. <laughs> so you calculate your, your heading M is your heading magnetic. That's your important one. Because that's the way you're going to point the plane, right? And then your GS there, the next column, is ground speed. So that's how quickly you're going to be flying over the ground. Changes because it depends which way you're pointing into wind. If you've got a wind behind you blowing you along, you're going to be going a lot faster than if you've got wind flat in your face. Yeah. E6B is great. Yeah, E6B is a nice little app. Um, if if you do do a PPL, right? If you do do a PPL, get Sporty's um, Sporty's E6B, which is like an app you can get, and you can do things like conversions. You can do weight and balance on it. So, for example, you want to convert gallons to liters. You know, it's got stuff for that. It's a brilliant little app. If you want to, you know, a lot of the calculations can be done on that thing. Um, but they like you to use the old computer as well to make sure you know how to. But in the days of modern stuff, like this has changed a lot in the last 10 years. <clears throat> You're doing your PPL once you've learned the manual way. Use four flight for now. Yeah. You've got to do the manual way for your PPL. Flight school, prep with squirrel. <laughs> it's like school over again. Dude, you, honestly, Lex, it really is. But when you come out the other side of it, you realize how much you didn't know about flying. You really do. And now that's, that's the real thing. Like, we had a guy in here at the start of the stream, and he came up with some glib comment about, why are you flying this toy? You know, go and fly a real plane. But what he actually doesn't realize is that every single pilot has to learn on a plane not too dissimilar to this. They have to learn all of this theory because they've got to learn how to fly before they can take a big plane up. I mean, yeah, if you fly a jet, you can just punch in coordinates and it works out all the maths for you and, and that's easy, right? But if you actually get down to a PPL level and do this stuff, you learn how to fly. Yeah, once you're the other side of it. I think that's what makes a lot of pilots so humble is because when they've gone through all that training, they look back and they think, geez, man, I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> There's so much I didn't know about flying that I now know. And you never stop learning. 
Yeah, that's true. You do have to have a, a good grasp of maths, really, and stuff. Like, if you're really bad at maths, you're going to struggle a bit. I mean, you can use calculators, but when you start talking about compasses and you're, like, making adjustments for magnetic, and you, your head's going to be like... Do they remember this while using Chewy Wave apps, um, Spam Fritter? I think you're bound to forget some of the detail. There's a lot of detail you don't need to remember, but ultimately, you know. So what I'm going to do is, because I'm not going to print that out, what I'm going to do is just quickly write down some of these headings. Uh, 201, 176, 169, and 173 just so that I can easily sort of follow them in the plane. Uh, so yeah, anyway, this is called your plug, your pilot's log. Uh, what you basically do is print this out and you stick this on your kneeboard. And what it, what it is, is quite simply, at the top, the top section there is where you write, you write down when you start the engine, when you stop the engine, when you're off blocks, when you're on blocks, that kind of thing. Uh, you make sure the plane's fueled up, make sure you've got enough endurance. Then it lists out your waypoints, which we just programmed in. Your waypoints, it's got our level. We said we're going to fly at 2,000 feet. It's got our heading. And at the very right column, it's got your time. Now, time is very important in flying. And particularly when you do your PPL. Because you you have to accurately be able to navigate. Back. Not you know, as you find out, one of the one of the minimum things that you need in a plane when you're flying is a timepiece some kind of a timepiece because if you're flying in a certain direction for a certain amount of time you can actually work out how far you've gone yeah and also it feeds into our checks as well because after us you know usually after each of these turns we'll be doing some kind of a, a check a free to check as it's called um but if you've got a long leg you'll cut it in half and do a check halfway along it Right, and then the next section there is all your frequencies. So what what Sky Demon does is calculate frequencies nearby, things you're going to want to speak to. So it's got Earl's Cone on there, it's got Lid on there, it's got South End on there, um, it's even got South End's Listening Squawk, which we can cover later. And then down at the bottom, it's got some of the like VOR stations and things, frequencies and the Morse code symbols. So it's got it's got pretty much everything you need on one page. It's really nice. Anyway, enough enough nattering. What we'll do. We'll go, go flying, use X-Plane, boom. So now it's taking a feed directly from X-Plane. Um, now as I fly, we're going to, I'll put this thing on and off as we fly. But for now, I'll just probably shrink that a little bit because you won't need it to be quite so big. But it'd be nice to just have it on the screen so we can like talk about it as we're flying. Maybe like that. Now, I've got it on live weather, live time, live weather, so whatever's happening out there is what's, in theory, happening in the sim. But let's just turn that off. You probably will have to remind me to put that thing on and off, because they'll probably forget. I'll start talking, and I've not actually turned it on, so <laughs> that's going to happen, just warn you now. All right. Shrink and keep it like a map. That's, that's kind of what I'm planning on doing just so that we can talk while we're flying. Why do you keep it on? I may I may keep it on. Um, right, so now what I need to do, because I'm not, let's just check my controls here. Bottle of mixture I need to do. This is actually way better spec than the plane I fly. This is the Air 4 Labs 172. I might have to put the, oh, maybe we can get away without it. Sail on at the X-Plane store at the moment for those interested in lots of aircraft and scenery. No, giddy. The, the default session is pretty good, um, but I like the Air 4 Labs one. All right, so we're going to hide that thing. <coughs> How do we zoom? There we go. Now, there are a whole bunch of checks that you would normally do um, around the outside of the plane, the inside of the plane, and all that good stuff, but we'll just basically uh, skip those. Happy go through some of the basics. So you put your main master on. <clears throat> Right, so I've actually got one second. Should have in my flight bag. Q 
There you go. So this this is my checklist here for the Cessna 172M. This is the plane I fly. So you have like a whole bunch of checks that you do in the cockpit. Yeah, that you go through. Bum, 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 bum. So this one's slightly different because it's specific to this plane. But generally speaking, it'll be like battery master on, fuel selector on both. Uh, you put a whole bunch of lights on, walk around the outside, make sure all your lights are working, that kind of thing. First aid kit's in there. Uh, you put the flaps all the way down. Generally speaking, you'd have the flaps down to make sure they'll work when you do an external check. Are you flying on all three screens? No. There's no point. Because if I do, I can't, I've got like chat and everything, I can't read all that stuff. So we'll assume we've done all the excels, uh, pre-start checklist, seat adjusted and locked, harness secure, parking brake is on. Trim is on takeoff, I'll put it slightly forward. Actually, there's only me in the plane, maybe not. Flight controls, you do all that check. All these switches are off, blah, blah, blah. Circuit breakers, fuel selectors on both. Set your mixture to rich. Check that your throttle moves. Um, wait, is there a carb heat in this thing? It doesn't look like there's a carb heat, so I'm, so I'm guessing that this is an injection engine. It looks like there's no carb heat to me. Okay. That's one less thing to worry about. <laughs> uh, so you check all the instruments are all undamaged and stuff. You check that your turn coordinator flag here is retracted. You check that the VSI is on within 200 feet of zero, generally speaking. And you check that the compass has got some sensible number on it and it's not got any weird marks and stuff. And then normally you'll have an OAT temperature gauge. Don't know where the temperature gauge is in this one. Oh, there you go, 19 Celsius. Fine. So anyway, you go for a start. So you put the beacon on like that. Now, on my plane, mate, just turn it on and point it full speed in the right direction. Hey, do a barrel roll on the way down there, yeah? Um, on my plane, there's actually a primer down here. But on this thing, if I remember, it's a manual prime off the fuel pump or something like that. Try to remember how you do it in this. The engine seems ideally primed. Okay. So normally on my plane, there's like a little thing that you pull to primer. it. So you put it on about a quarter. And then you stick your head out the window, call clear prop. And then you go for a start. Get your hand on the throttle ready. And then you're looking for 1200 but you're basically immediately looking at these dials here. Like, you want to make sure that's the critical one there, the oil pressure. If that doesn't come up immediately, turn it off. Yeah. If that, otherwise you're going to do severe engine damage. You're looking for the oil pressure to come up immediately. Engine's cold, so you won't see that for a while. But everything's holding. So you just leave, leave it idling at 1,200. That's what you're looking for. Um, throttle... Uh, engine started. So, start to warn and light's gone out. Which I don't actually know where it is on this. That's the test switch. Is that making sense, guys? Feel free to ask any questions if you're not sure. Uh, right, so your low voltage light's gone out, which is your... We don't have one on this, but what we have on this plane is this thing. Uh, and this should always read zero so it's not draining the battery there's some charge going into the battery basically then you check the flaps so normally you check them in stages 20 degrees 10 degrees zero degrees and you'll be checking them visually as well uh, that's a notched flap which is awesome mine isn't notched so you have to basically hold it down and go 1000 2000 look out the window <laughs> There is a low volts enunciator. Uh, don't know where it is though. Is it on here? By any chance. Uh, so then you've got 
Right, fuel tanks, EG, there's an EGT gauge on this one as well. Uh, vacuum, which is your suction, that should be in the green. Then you want to be setting your pressure, which is 1019 today. So you put your, on the left here. You put that onto 1019. That should read, like, if this is your airfield, you should know roughly what the elevation is. That should be pretty close to whatever the elevation is. Yeah, which is, L's count's about 270 or something. So we know that's right. Uh, vertical speed. Okay, I think that looks good. Then we check magnetos. Um, so if you look at the RPM gauge, if we get the RPM gauge on like 200, say about there, yeah, if we get the RPM on 200 and then we check the mags, what we're looking for is is just, this is not a proper check, this is just a, what they call a continuity check, but you're just making sure that the mags are working, so you go get about 100 RPM drop or so, and then same on that one. If the engine starts coughing and spluttering and misfiring at that point, engine off, you're not flying, yeah. It's one of those go no go things. Uh, we're going to go down to lid, JK, is where we're going to go today. So we want to get the avionics on now. So we'll let that all fire up. this point you'd sort of punch in your frequencies and stuff oil checked what do you mean you mean the, you're talking about the exterior yeah because I checked it on the menu before on here so no the, the oil was fine how close is it to real life if you're doing a PPL, flying in a sim will definitely help you. Right, so on this thing here, which will do that. I mean, it's up to you whether you use this or not. Um, actually, let's let's not use it. Let's just leave it. We'll not use it. Let's use Sky Demon instead. Okay, so then we're on to pre-taxi checks, uh, squelch and volume. So what you've, what you've done at this point is you've set the frequencies that you want in here on, on COM2. You've checked wrong button. That button there on mine is the squelch button. <laughs> on this one, it's the power button. You basically punch in the frequency that you're going to use and start and just check that it's all working. Uh, G10650, audio panel, it's all different on mine. And at this point, you make a note of the... It's probably not on this one. You make a note of this, which is your TACO reading, uh, and the current time. And then you make, an, uh, you make a call to radio, get your airfield information, get your barrow, set your barrow in there, all that kind of stuff. And then you're pretty much done for that. And we can actually go on taxi. So let's see. Peter, who we don't need today, we'll put the taxi light on. Put that to there. And since we're going to take off, I'll just quickly show you where we're going. <coughs> so... 2-4 is actually down this taxiway here. Um, normally you're surrounded by like planes and stuff here. And you'll often be facing this way at Earl's Cone. They'll spin you around so that you go out this way. Fuel pumps are over here. They're not shown for some reason. You go all the way down to the bottom there. And then we're going to do our power checks down there. And then we're taking off this way. Coming back this way is 2-4. So we're taking off in that direction. Essentially. Oh, I forgot all about my tea. What a scumbag. So if you look at Sky Demon, 
it's got <clears throat> at the bottom log, log engine start which frankly I never remember to do but it doesn't matter I'll write the taco down and then we're going to press log off the blocks there like that I got the parking brake. Let's do it manually, I guess. Right, let's get moving. And that helipad there, that's where Essex and Hart's uh, ambulance take off from. So you'd have done a brake check to make sure your brakes are working. Yeah, you can go on the grass, it's fine. There's actually a northern taxiway at Earlscombe that most people don't realise. This is the tarmac taxiway and the north side there is actually another taxiway. Now you got you got to make sure you stay on the line here and not go left of it because otherwise the wing will hit this um, like fence and stuff, and you'll be very unpopular. Uh, Carl, Kuh, what you're looking at right now is. Um, a local airfield. When we get up, you'll see like proper photo scenery. So don't don't judge the graphics just yet. All right. If you actually look at our Sky Demon now. It's actually tracking us. Your fuel seems pretty low. What, three quarters of a tank? What what dial are you looking at? Now normally what I do here is I do my um, a couple of my checks as I'm en route here. So as you make <clears throat> as you're going along and you make a right turn, you're looking for the you were looking for like compass movement mark. You're looking for a turn here, opposite slip ball, and the attitude indicator stable and erect. That's what you're looking for. So that should turn, that should turn, that should go the opposite way, and that should stay level. That's what you're looking for. And there's like some of the checks that you do. Yeah, Earl's Cone Captain Beanie used to be like three runways. Yeah, Zinni. Right, so you see the um, temperatures come up now on the engine. Pressure's still good. Oh, there's a standby altimeter. That one is down here on my plane, the standby one. Okay, we appear to be stuck in mud. <laughs> Have you ever had any problems with airplanes when flying? Yep. Um, the plane I fly at the moment <clears throat> doesn't have this standard six pack. It has what's called an Aspen EFD. Uh, so it, it looks a lot like, say, like an Airbus with the altitude ticker. Um, airspeed ticker and then artificial horizon and then all the information overlaid about heading and stuff <clears throat> that thing is actually broken at the moment <laughs> so when I take off it looks okay and then you take off and then it just goes bah, bah, and puts a red cross right through it and says broken so that's I'm flying with that completely dead which means I have to use the uh, analog airspeed which is over here uh, the analog uh, al altimeter and the magnetic compass to see where I'm going <clears throat> so yeah that's how I was flying currently until they fix it 
And it's another reason why you have to be able to do things with the, the proper analog equipment, because if your, your lovely digital stuff fails you, then, you know, you're up in a plane. What are you going to do? <clears throat> I'm not even going to answer that question, Gordon. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's happened. I've also had... COM1 failure and had to go to COM2. I've had my cable, like the cable connectors that you plug in down here. Like that. I've had those like go funny on me and like intermittent, which is the worst thing. Like an intermittent connection. That's a real pain. So stuff does happen. I've also had like Overreading RPM gauges, uh, underreading VSI gauges. <laughs> you get all kinds. Right, so normally there's a there's a run up area here, there's a run up area here. X planes grass seems a bit weird, so I'm I'm probably just gonna do it on the tarmac. Uh, I use a David Clarkson headset, Giddy. I'd love one of those posh Bose ones, but they're like a thousand pounds or something ridiculous. So anyway, we'll we'll stay off the grass and we'll just run up here. That'll do. What you're supposed to do is what you're supposed to do is turn the aircraft roughly into wind. So there's there's normally a windsock here, but the, oh, there is. As you can see, it's blowing across. Which I don't think is right because it said it was coming in at 310. So that's a bit weird. You've seen this airport before, why not? <laughs> um, and then you get your checklist out and you do a very important check, uh, which is called the power check. So you, you look behind you to make sure there's nothing behind you, set your parking brake to on, uh, you get your throttle up at 1200 though, as before. And then you check that your T's and P's are all good. And then you throttle up to 1700. So you get yourself at 1700 there. You check your brakes are holding. If you've got a carb heat, you're popping out at this point. And uh, heat up the carburetor, de-ice it, that kind of thing. And then you do your magneto check. So you get a drop in RPM of about 100. Should go back to 17. Do the other magneto. Same thing. And you, what you're basically looking for there is no more than 100 RPM drop and the difference between left and right no more than about 75. You, so you're looking for like... this. Think about it this way. In a sim you don't care, but in real life this is your last opportunity to make sure that your engine is running okay. So if you hear any pops and crackles, if the RPM's fluctuating around, if you jump on the magnetos and it's a bit weird, when I check the carb heat, I pretty much always do it twice. What are magnetos? They're res magnetos are responsible for creating um, high voltage that sparks the plugs. So they're very important. And there's two of them for a reason. Because if they fail, yeah. Baz, does this plane have a TPWS? No. It doesn't, Baz. You gotta use your eyes, mate. Old school. Uh, Magneto, so yeah. You're looking for temperatures and pressures are all good. And everything's good. Your charging voltage is good. Which is your anemometer, as it's called. Which is that thing. Some of them indicate a positive charge. Others will indicate like a zero reading to make sure they're okay. And then what you then do is an idle check. So you pull the throttle right back. And you should get around about 700 RPM. Somewhere on a Cessna, somewhere between 5 and 700. And the reason that's important is because if you've got a high idle, when you're coming into land and you pull out the throttle, you're getting more force than you actually want. So you're going to be landing faster. So you want to make sure that you've got a good idle, a good power... And that's it, you know. 
Then you go for your pre-takeoff actions, so you make sure your fuel's on both. You set your trim to takeoff. Flaps on a Cessna 172, you don't use flaps normally on takeoff. Uh, if you're doing like a short field, uh, where you want to get off the ground quickly, you'll go with the 10 degrees of flaps. But other than that, on a Cessna, you don't. Something like a Warrior, you do. Um, so no flaps, mixtures rich, in the words, all the way in. Uh, throttle friction. On a, on a Cessna, you actually have a little friction lever here uh, that you can twist and it tightens up the throttle so as you're flying along it doesn't kind of vibrate and change throttle. Uh, strobe lights come on at this point. Uh, tax light can come off. Uh, nav lights can go on and... Actually, in our airfield we don't use nav lights for some reason. I don't know why. Put the landing lights on. Magnetos are on both. Uh, primer we don't have everything else is on altimeters are set frequencies are set transponder goes to altitude on this 7000 which is VFR then you check your harnesses and stuff check your flight controls make sure everything's working uh, there's normally a little mirror here that you can look at that shows the rudder so that when you when you do that you can actually see the rudder in the mirror so you've done your control check. And the one th final thing that you do, and my instructor was really picky about this. He actually wrote in big letters at the bottom of my pre-takeoff checklist, briefing in capital letters. He insisted that I brief him on what we were about to do, <laughs> which is a good idea. Because it's easy to get caught up in checklists and then suddenly you start barreling down the runway and you're like, okay, what exactly what were we doing? So if I put the if I put the thing to there, what you would normally do is you go down the runway here, so down two four, and you get to about five hundred feet, and you start to make your left turn, and you make your left turn onto whatever heading we're going for, which is Whitton. So we're going to keep climbing all the way to two thousand because there's only me on board. We'll probably be at two thousand by the time we get to Whitton, no problem at all. Any questions? <laughs> is that too... Is, is that uh, mini-map okay? Or is that too big or too small? Your instructor always insisted on takeoff uh, backup plane in case there's an engine failure. Climbing. Other life jackets. Uh, you don't need life jackets unless you're flying over a stretch of water, normally. No, I've not took Mrs. Squirrel. I've took both my daughters up, though. All right, let's go flying, then. Let's go to widescreen. Shall we the brake? Now, one of the downsides of a Cessna is you don't get a tremendously good view like that. So, at this point, you're going to call ready for departure. Um, even the Wales Cone is actually just a radio, so they can't... They have no authorization. Uh, to tell you whether you can take off or not. Um, so what you would normally do, you'd be listening on to see if anybody's on the circuit, seeing if there's anybody coming in, but you always just tilt the aircraft and just have a quick look before you go on here to make sure nobody's on approach that didn't make a radio call. Because people do do stuff like that, believe it or not. <laughs> 